Well, hello, and welcome back to another Teleaquarium here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. Uh, my name is Alex, and if you joined us a little earlier today, we actually had another Teleaquarium. We're trying to do them a couple times a day when we can. We certainly want to get new programs up every day, so uh, hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see more of these. But earlier today, uh, Haley and I actually did Sunday Fish Sketch, which is a, a Twitter hashtag where people sketch fish uh, according to a theme on Sundays. And we chose deep sea fish um, based off of today's theme. And we talked just a, a bit about deep sea exploration during that program as well. Uh, and I mentioned that I would be talking about how scientists explore the deep, uh, particularly with regards to robots. So what I have in front of me here is actually an underwater robot. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about uh, for most of today. Uh, but we're also going to talk about some simpler items as well, like this camera over here. Uh, and how scientists use those, and how you could actually use those. Um, these are becoming more and more affordable today. It's kind of like uh, if you maybe have a quadcopter, or you got a friend with a quadcopter. You know, 10 years ago, that would have been uh, insanely expensive. And prices on ROVs, uh, which we'll go over what that means, that's actually coming down. Uh, and it's making this sort of science a lot more approachable, uh, not only for the scientists, you know, budget is a thing when you're uh, doing research, but it's also more approachable to hobbyists. So kind of go over how scientists are using them and maybe some options if you're interested in using these uh, for yourself or in a classroom setting as well. Uh, so we'll get started in a little slideshow here. If you have any questions, please go ahead and toss those down into the chat below. Um, but we're actually going to be talking about underwater robots or ROVs, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so ROV actually is an acronym. It stands for uh, remotely operated vehicle. So these are our robots. Um, there's no one in these. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's alternative, I guess, to the human occupied vehicle. Uh, so that would be actually a submersible that has people inside. But the remotely operated vehicle is operated by people that are still on the surface uh, and they aren't inside this. Now that has a couple benefits, right? Why do we want to be remote? Uh, well, one of those benefits is you can be a little bit more uh, relaxed. It is a safer environment for the most part. I mean, you still frequently do have to be uh, by the water, so there's always that risk there. But the ROV doesn't need human comforts. It doesn't need human safety measures uh, because it doesn't need air, uh, that sort of thing. And it, being a robot, you can actually build it to go to a much deeper depth than a lot of submarines that would have uh, humans inside. And uh, obviously there is a bit of a, a setback there. Uh, there's a kind of an argument. If you've ever heard the argument of sending more uh, rovers to Mars or actually sending people to Mars, there's a similar argument in ocean exploration. Should we be sending people in human-occupied submersibles or should we be sending down uh, people or should we be sending down robots, ROVs? Um, so there's kind of a, a cost to each of those. Turn left and stop. See, that's what it'd be like if you had me for a face. I can't breathe. So driving an ROV is very much like that. You're not actually in the ROV uh, driving it around, but you are instead uh, guiding it, as the name suggests, remotely. Um, so these are typically tethered back to the surface over that. Uh, so there's a little bit of lag when you're, when you're piloting them, just a little bit. And obviously, you can only see what the camera shows you. Um, now, the cameras have gotten pretty complex. So on the screen right now, you can actually see two options for ROVs. We have uh, on the left, very, very simple. This is actually an ROV made out of uh, PVC piping, just like plastic pipe I can go buy at the hardware store. It's got a little camera on there. It's actually got a little light. We'll get into this because if you are maybe a teacher or you're uh, interested in doing this uh, as a hobby even, you can do this. You can build yourself a little ROV uh, for relatively cheap and they're pretty fun to mess around with. But then on the other side, we have the, the scientific uh, vehicles that have been exploring the deep now for years. Uh, and they are starting to get smaller and more affordable like that uh, ROV I showed you at the beginning. Uh, but this one right here uh, is about the size of a, a small Jeep, you can see, or like a small car. Um, and it goes down all the way to the bottom. Uh, it's got these nice bright lights and it actually beams this footage then back up to the surface. So we can see what's down there. Uh, and the footage is really nice and clear. 
Uh, the cameras on these are just professional grade high definition cameras. And you can actually watch this sort of stuff happen live nowadays. Uh, and I think that's probably what's the most exciting to me about uh, ROVs is that uh, because it's already getting piped up through video, because it's tethered to a ship, I can actually go online and watch this science happen live. So one website you can do this at is Nautilus Live, which is nautiluslive.org, and all of these links we're going over today, those are down in the description below. But Nautilus Live, uh, the exploration vessel Nautilus, or EV Nautilus, is actually operated by the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, and they go out every year and they do several months of exploration using their ROVs. Uh, and you can just tune in on their website when they're doing this and it's all live. Uh, you can even type in questions and they'll answer them. I myself had an opportunity to go on that vessel back in 2018 um, as a fellow on board. And so that's an opportunity as well if you go to the Ocean Exploration Trust website or that nautiluslive.org there as well. Um, there are fellowships that get you on board. If you are um, maybe going to school for engineering, if you're going to school for any sort of marine bio, if you're going to school for communications. Um, my degree is more uh, used towards communications, what I'm doing now, where I'm teaching people about the ocean. Uh, and that is actually a fellowship that's on there, is the Science Communications Fellowship. So if you're interested in that, check out nautiluslive.org. Uh, they'll be streaming hopefully later this summer. They do have a, a planned uh, cruise season coming up. Another one is the, the federal government here in the U.S., uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmo Atmospheric Administration. Um, they actually have an Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and there's another link there. Uh, again, these are down in the, in the bottom. But they'll stream from the Okeanos Explorer a lot of times, which is a NOAA vessel, uh, and those are some great streams as well. They do, uh, because it's federal and because uh, they're doing a lot more of this exploration and research um, for other maybe uh, federal departments, that sort of thing, they have actually looked at a lot of shipwrecks in the past. So if you're excited about that sort of stuff, uh, be sure to check them out. And another one that up until just a couple weeks ago was streaming but is currently on a hiatus right now is the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And they've been streaming down uh, in Australia, uh, actually doing some deep water corals and sponge communities and uh, undersea canyons there off of Australia. So that's schmittocean.org. Um, the link is down below in the description. So being able to actually watch these live online, you can hear the scientists talking about what they're seeing. You can ask them questions. Uh, they'll get back to you. It's really just a, a fun thing to kind of put on you know, maybe not watching all eight hours of a dive, um, but you can always have it on in the background, listen to the scientists chat about it, and catch something really cool when it comes up. So ROVs, very expensive. Before I get into how you can do this as a hobbyist, I'm going to talk about a slightly less expensive alternative, although it can still be very expensive. A simpler robot, if you will. It doesn't uh, drive around. It doesn't have... Uh, you know, thrusters that push it around underwater, but just cameras. Just dropping a camera down and seeing what shows up in front of the camera is a fantastic way to uh, explore the ocean or to at least see what wildlife is there. So both of these cameras here are baited, um, which there's actually another acronym for this. I don't have it on the slide, but it's BRUV or BRUVS, B-R-U-V-S, uh, and that stands for uh, baited remote underwater video systems or video surveys, depending on uh, what source you're looking at. But this camera over on the left, uh, this is uh, in, a, in a more shallow region. These have actually been used to pretty great effect looking at shark populations on some reefs. But right out here on that stick out front is some bait, and it's just chopped up fish uh, frequently, and it kind of draws in creatures to in be in front of the camera. On the right, this is also bait, but it's an entirely different type of bait. This actually lights up, uh, and it mimics the distress bioluminescence of a deep-sea jellyfish, uh, and that actually brings in animals. In fact, this system, uh, this little bait system, was how we obtained the first footage of giant squid in their natural habitat. Um, this was done uh, several years back, and you can find that footage where it's just this little ball of acrylic, and inside the ball there are some electrical lights, uh, and again, they flash like a jellyfish that's in distress, and that brings in things that might want to eat those jellyfish, or might want to eat what's eating the jellyfish. All right, so you want to do this. 
Uh, where do we get started? If you want to do this as a hobbyist, or you want to do this, maybe you're a teacher, uh, maybe you just want to do this with your kids. You know, it could be a good time just getting out and seeing what's in your nearby lake, or if you're by the ocean, go explore that. Like I said, the camera is the cheaper alternative. So just doing a camera. Uh, and this can be really simple because there's only a couple of things you need for a camera to work in this way. You got to have a camera that will record when you're not around. You can just press record and leave it alone and it'll still record. That's pretty easy to come by. Most cameras will do that. You don't have to hold down the record button. You also need a waterproof housing, obviously. You, you want this thing to be safe. Uh, don't go putting your phone in the water um, unless, of course, maybe you have a, an appropriate waterproof housing for it. You need ballast. Uh, that's a term we haven't gone over yet. That's just weight. I, I use rocks for ballast. You'll see my little setup here in, in, a, in a, just a minute or two. Uh, and then you want rope, because you gotta bring these back up. The professional cameras, um, frequently they have ropes if they're in shallow water, but once they're deeper, they actually have automated release systems that drop their ballast and they come back up. If you're trying to do this cheap, just go get yourself something like a GoPro uh, in a waterproof housing and tie a little piece of string to it and go down to a dock or something like that and just lower it down and see what it records. You haul it back up, plug that uh, into your computer and see what the footage is. And you might be surprised what just shows up in front of your camera. Uh, so I actually put together a little camera system here at the Sea Life Center and we've used it um, down to about 100 feet, just off a dock here. Uh, and this camera is actually a Raspberry Pi computer, which is a tiny, uh, tiny little computer. You can look that up as Raspberry Pi Pi, like the number. Um, and that's what's on top there, that little green chip. That's a little tiny Raspberry Pi computer, and underneath it is just a phone charger that I had lying around. It just so happened to be the right size, and there's a little camera on the front there. That happens to fit into uh, an old dive light housing that we had. So this camera system was a great example of a cheap camera system that actually does a pretty good job. Uh, almost everything here was just items we had lying around at the Sea Life Center. This dive light was part of our dive team's equipment, and uh, it wasn't working anymore, the actual light part. But it was still waterproof, so we uh, used that as our camera housing. And then we've got those rocks. Those are my ballast, just, I don't know, like uh, 30 pounds of rocks to hold it down to the bottom. Had a little milk crate, uh, a bunch of rope, put the camera inside, and then this is actually that little bait stick, and it slides right on the front uh, so that we can fill that up. We actually use chopped squid uh, from leftover dissections here at the Sea Life Center when we're doing uh, class, classroom dissections. A lot of times we have some leftover chopped up squid and it makes a great bait. So we actually lower this down, like I said, about 100 feet. Here's some footage of it being dropped down. Uh, and you can see even just on the way down to the bottom, we encounter things. So this nice little loop has uh, some shrimp that were just cruising in the water column. And then once we get to the bottom, we actually see stuff creeping around. So we did purchase some dive lights that are pretty cheap. Um, we just needed them to go down 100 feet, and we just left them on all night, basically, to see what would show up. So you have this little crab comes and checks the camera out. Uh, we, of course, get lots of fish that come in. Um, they're kind of drawn in by that light and by the bait as well. And then we get bigger animals. Even down at 100 feet, we got this harbor seal that just came and checked out the camera. Now, we don't get to see this footage until we bring it back up to the surface, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, like I said, I, I work with an after-school club here at the Sea Life Center. It's pretty exciting to actually haul this camera up, crack into that footage, and see what kind of creeped in front of your camera while you weren't around. We also got an even larger pinniped, uh, or a flipper-footed marine mammal, in a stellar sea lion that came out to check out our camera. Uh, it just came on down there. You might notice that little stick on the front. Uh, that's actually just a thing we stuck there uh, that has uh, the centimeters marked out. We just marked out 10 centimeters, or about four inches, um, on, on the, the stick there, and uh, it works out pretty well. And then when we did manage to catch little things as well, like this tiny marine worm, we happened to catch it getting eaten by a fish. Uh, and we discovered that if you focus a Raspberry Pi's camera all the way close in, you can even resolve the plankton that is just millimeters away from the lens. Um, so it is a pretty fun little tool just to mess around and see what's living in your water. This was uh, one of my favorite clips. This is actually a scallop, a um, little, little shellfish, a little bivalve. They swim, believe it or not. You can see it kind of going on by there. In my head, it always makes like the little waka 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 sounds from uh, Pac-Man. Uh, but they just cruise around and you never know what you're going to find in front of your camera. 
We did one day get an octopus, actually came down, uh, which was pretty exciting. This was a very young, giant Pacific octopus, and it tried to trap some stuff there, and then it actually turned its eyes to our light uh, and came and attacked part of our camera. Um, so now it has been octopus-proofed. Once I brought it up, I figured out what exactly it was trying to pull off and what it pulled off the camera, uh, and we, we managed to secure that more. And finally, in this last clip here from the camera, of a seal coming in and disturbing all these Alaskan spot prawns that are on the bait. The seal doesn't care how much about the bait, but it comes to check out what this light's shining on, uh, and it really disturbs all those shrimp. So again, that can be done really cheaply. Uh, I'd love to actually do a little series of videos um, just walking you through how to put that camera system together. And then we get to the ROVs. More expensive, uh, but I'll show you a couple cheap options here. We have do-it-yourself ROVs or the more do-it-yourself ROVs, like those PVC ROVs I was talking about where you're just using plastic pipes so you can get at the hardware store. Um, and you can actually get these kits. Um, so there's ROV in a box and there's Seamate. There are other groups that have um, these ROVs for sale or these kits for sale. These two are just two that I, I'm familiar with. Um, and again, the link's down below, but they'll send you the PVC pipes, um, and they'll send you the thrusters. They're actually made out of little bilge motors frequently. Uh, or sometimes for a cheaper option, they'll actually just provide a parts list um, for, for just a few dollars, and you can go source these yourself if you have a big hardware store nearby. And then there's more what's called a prosumer ROV. These are sort of that quadcopter level I was talking about. This is a hobbyist ROV. Um, again, getting away from pretty cheap, maybe a couple hundred bucks for the, the PVC ROVs down to several thousand dollars potentially if you're dipping into it. Um, but these, of course, are uh, sturdier uh, machines. And here is the source of that picture that I had of the little PVC ROV. So this is, uh, is a photo of several members of our Ocean Sciences Club here at the Alaska Sea Life Center uh, putting together PVC ROVs just in the classroom. Um, and then we actually got to go and drive these in our local swimming pool. Uh, so you can see them kind of just cruising around there. Uh, this tiny little box one was definitely my favorite. Uh, it was very small, um, but actually pretty agile. Now, I'm not sure how well it would do in a, in a big current or something like that, um, but it's a challenge for the kids to design this because they have to figure out where do we put the thrusters so that it's well under control when we're piloting it? Where do we put the, the flotation? Where do we put the weight uh, to keep it well balanced? And again, you can see that tether, that line, that connects this up to the surface, and it actually connects it over to our pilot, uh, who's driving it with a little camera view from a television there. So this is all uh, able to be done just with those little do-it-yourself kits. Now this is the ROV I showed off at the beginning. Uh, we're gonna talk about this, and I'll show it off a little more. Um, but this is a prosumer ROV. So I had two there uh, on that page earlier. One was from the SoFar Ocean uh, group that's Trident, and that used to be Open ROV. Um, so the Trident is really speedy, uh, more portable. Um, I have had the opportunity to mess around with it. It's pretty fun. And then this one here that you see on the screen now, this is from Blue Robotics, and this is the Blue ROV2. Uh, you can see all that tether. We actually have about 1,000 feet of tether. Uh, it's a lot of tether. So, you know, if you're just doing this hobby-wise, you probably don't need that much tether. We also put a little GoPro on the front there. There's a little gripper arm. Um, I'll show you uh, another close-up of the ROV, but something to notice is it is piloted just with an Xbox controller. Um, so, it, you know, it's pretty easy, and we even just let the kids do this with the Ocean Science Club. You can see it's pretty maneuverable. This is it actually cruising around our SEAL tank. Uh, one day when the tank was empty, we were able to just put this in and check it out. And it's a nice maneuverable little, uh, little craft. And like I said, we actually let the kids pilot this. Um, so we put them in one of our rooms here at the Sea Life Center and uh, put them in charge of it. And actually, you have them drive around back behind the Sea Life Center, and they get to explore. They get to mark down what they're finding. Now, something I don't think we've mentioned it in any of our teleaquariums, but the Alaska Sea Life Center actually has uh, some tsunami debris in the water behind us from 1964 when there was an earthquake and tsunami um, that year. And uh, the kids were actually able to go and find some of that debris. They also just found a lot of tires that people have rolled into the water over the years, and they were always excited, whether it was debris or tires or an animal of some sort. 
you can see here uh, that control setup, just a little laptop with an Xbox controller plugged into it. And uh, we just kind of rotated through who was piloting it. And the area we were piloting it was just right back here behind the Sea Life Center. So here's the Sea Life Center. You can see submerged ruins. There's a lot of stuff back here. Um, and we get some really nice shots. This is actually from the GoPro that's on board the ROV. Um, but we were able to kind of drive it around, uh, see what we could see. And then we were able to get out there and actually uh, find the tsunami debris. So this here is not the tsunami debris yet. This is actually a little sea lion. Um, the sea lions like to come check out our ROV. So that was just a little juvenile sea lion uh, that kind of came and stalked us for a bit. Um, and they actually followed us. We found this little fish trap back there. This was actually from our aquarium department, just seeing what was out back behind the Sea Life Center. And while we were checking it out with the ROV, uh, those sea lions came and checked it out with us. So very curious critters. They definitely seem to show up whenever we put the ROV in the water. Um, whether they're hearing it or they're seeing the light, they come, they come check it out. They always come say, hey, when we're driving it. And then here is the tsunami debris. So it's just this cliff. Uh, and there's all this old debris. Uh, there's actually some twisted rails in there from the uh, railway uh, that ran along the waterfront here in Seward before the tsunami. You can see those rails up top. Those are all twisted rails from, uh, from trains. So pretty fun to find all that sort of stuff. And finally, I have a clip here uh, of the kids coming across one of their favorite things to find. So go ahead and listen. It's a little louder, but see if you can hear what they find. That's a monster truck tire. That's like a truck. That is a tire we are marking down to the That's so cool. So as you might have been able to discern there, uh, they found a tire. And they, they love those tires um, whenever they are finding them. All right, so I'll just bring you back on over here. And we are going to just go over uh, some of the equipment that we've got. There we go. Got my camera all uh, turned around. But uh, this is the blue ROV. Uh, and I know I, I had this as one of the non-do-it-yourself ROVs, but it is very much still uh, a hands-on ROV in its construction. Because when it shows up, you actually have to uh, wire up a lot of the gear inside. So if you are more technically inclined, if you, if you enjoy kind of wiring stuff up, um, this is a pretty fun one. And I actually selected this because it is much more modular. Um, you can swap in parts, you can swap out parts. We actually have two extra thrusters uh, for uh, vertical control, and that allows us to have a much more stable camera platform, uh, which is nice when the kids are driving it. You know, the, the uh, getting the hang of the controls uh, for them, it's a little herky-jerky sometimes, but we get there. Of course, that big old spool of um, the tether that I spoke about as well. And then over this way, we have that camera that I dropped down, the baited remote underwater video system. Uh, and this actually uh, is a little different from the one you saw. I am upgrading it. I actually bought a tiny little housing. It's a teeny tiny little housing uh, from Blue Robotics, the same group that uh, makes that ROV and sells that ROV. Um, and we are replacing the camera and that sort of stuff in here. Uh, again, if you are interested in uh, maybe making one of these yourself, uh, Stay tuned, because I, I really want to put together some instructions either here on YouTube, uh, probably a little series of how to put this together, uh, or on our website, alaskasealife.org. And I want to put together a little series kind of going into how to build one of these, because uh, you've got to program it a little bit. And it's actually programmed to record only motion. There's a little camera in there. I'm not sure how well you can make out that camera. Uh, but it records motion. And so that way, if something cruises in front of it, it just snaps a little clip and uh, you're hopefully not missing those very cool creatures that come in, in front of you. All right. So I just wanted to share with you a couple options uh, and, and some insight into how scientists are using robots in the ocean. Um, you know, we think uh, electricity and water, it doesn't mix, right? But I mean, you can use a little robot and actually explore the ocean, explore all the way down to the deepest depths of the ocean uh, and it's something that is actually becoming a, a hobby um, for many people to be able to explore. So I hope that you uh, enjoyed this little uh, talk. And if you have any questions, throw them down in the comments. We'll try to get some answers for you. Uh, but otherwise, stay tuned for more Tell Aquarium from the Alaska Sea Life Center. Uh, and I'll, I'll sign off with this. 
reminding you that the ocean is largely unexplored. And you should get out there and try to explore what you can.